right. And uh, today, our guest speaker is Joel Kurz, and many of you know Joel already. And Joel is pastor of the Garden Church in Baltimore and also the director of One Hope, which is a ministry seeking to build healthy churches in the inner city. He lives in West Baltimore with his wife and four children. Please welcome Joel Kurz. It is good to be with you today. Thanks for having me. I know some of you heard that Pastor Joel was going to be in the pulpit today and you got excited. And you're looking at me thinking, who is this guy? I thought Pastor Joel was going to be back. Different Joel. Uh, but it is a privilege to be with you. And uh, I will say, your Pastor Joel is a good friend of mine and a blessing. He's been a blessing for many years. Fifteen years ago, I got a phone call from him. And he told me that he was going to be my church planning coach back when he was uh, doing more uh, denominational work. And uh, so he was... My coach in the early days, and he's just been a, a support and a partner, and you guys are a support and a partner for our church and our ministry, One Hope, as we seek to plant churches. And I'm just so thankful for everybody here and, and so many of you that I know, uh, missions teams that you've sent, hospitality that you've given, and also I'm just so thankful for the fact that you've given your pastor this sabbatical time. Well done, and uh, I'm sure he's going to come back refreshed, and you'll be blessed and benefited because of it. Um, I had the opportunity to preach to your youth some months ago, and I gave them a very br abbreviated version of this sermon. And when I had this invitation, I thought, I want to preach the same thing, but I want to go more in depth, uh, because it is so foundational to my own ministry and to your ministry. And it comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and I simply want to tag this sermon, not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed of the gospel. So if you would turn there with me, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Once you're there, say amen. amen. If you need more time, say hold on. I think we're good to go. Let's stand together one more time as we read God's Word. Would you stand with me? Romans 1, 16 and 17, it says this. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray together and ask God for his help as we study these verses. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. God, I pray this morning as we understand why we ought not be ashamed of the gospel, that you would help us to see Christ through your word. Help me as I preach to preach your truths, not merely my own ideas. And God, I pray that you would open the hearts, the minds of all of us in this room, that we might be shaped according to the fashion and the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of the gospel? Some years ago, I met a young lady named Bina. She was working at an Indian restaurant where my wife and I often went for dinner. And the more we went, the more we got to know her. She was our waitress. And at one point, we began to talk about religion. And, and uh, I asked her about Christianity. And she said she'd never heard, of, uh, heard much about Christianity. And I said, well, would you like to get together sometime? So we did to intentionally talk about Christianity. And when I sat down with Bina, I started off with this question. Have you ever heard much about Christianity? And her response was, 
surprising to me. She said, no. Well, that wasn't the surprise. What was surprising was the fact that she said that she knows four Christians, and they take an hour commute to school and back every day, five days a week, times two hours, that's 10 hours a week, she rides with Christians. And, I, and at first I was like, oh, cool, cool, what have they told you about Christianity? And she said, nothing. Nothing. And in that moment, I was, I was encouraged that I had the opportunity to say, well, let me tell you about Christianity. Let me tell you about Jesus. But I was also sad. As I thought of the fact that she had four Christian friends who had 10 hours a week to talk to her about what they believe about Jesus, and they never, they never said one word. But I wasn't sad in like some kind of self-righteous sort of way. I was also sad because I had been one of those friends at one point. You know what I'm saying? Like I had had opportunities after opportunity to share Jesus with someone who's not in my life anymore. And I didn't. And I don't know why. Why are we often ashamed of the gospel? You know, maybe her friends didn't tell her about Jesus because they thought, well, it's not time yet. You know, we haven't built enough of a relationship yet. Or maybe they thought they would come across as too churchy. Maybe they thought they would come across as too religious. Maybe they didn't believe it. They didn't really believe Jesus. I don't know. But what I did know in that moment, and what I know now, and what I want to encourage you toward is to not be ashamed of the gospel message. Amen? Amen. This line encourages me, and it challenges me. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You don't want to be ashamed of the gospel. I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel. We want to boldly lift high the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I believe that the Roman Christians probably did not want to be ashamed of the gospel. But consider these poor Christians in Rome. They had opposition on every side. Historians tell us that on one side, they had opposition from the pagans who accused them of worshiping a false god and not uh, worshiping the true gods of Rome. On the other side, they had opposition from their fellow Jews who saw them as crazy because they're following this supposed Messiah who died and they claimed that he rose from the dead. They had opposition. They had challenges. They had reasons to maybe hesitate in their faith and to be reluctant in sharing the gospel. And we too, if we're honest, we could talk about natural fleshly reasons as to why we might be ashamed of the gospel message. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says there's four reasons the gospel is offensive to the world. Number one, first, it tells us that we are unable to save ourselves. And that's offensive. That is offensive to the moral person. That is offensive to the proud individual who says, I can save myself. Second, to believe that Jesus had to die for us is an offense to the self-righteous. To people who believe that at their core, they're pretty good. They're pretty moral. This offends the self-righteous. Third, the gospel says that no one is good enough to be saved. And if you don't come to Jesus, you will not be saved. Well, this offends the pluralist. Fourth, the gospel is about Jesus suffering and serving, not conquering and destroying. And this offends those who want to take life easy and take it safe. This offends those who want retaliation and to, to live in their anger. Not to mention doctrines such as sin, faith, heaven, hell, judgment, God's law, morality, the need for grace. Every bit of it is offensive to the fleshly mind. And so when I ask this question, have you ever been ashamed of the gospel? 
You know, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said, the person who says, well, no, I've never once in my life been ashamed of the gospel, he said, it's probably not because they're such an exceptional Christian. It's probably because they don't fully understand the gospel and how offensive it is to the world. And so in our flesh, we have a tendency to hide, to withdraw, to be ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is offensive to the sinner. It is a stumbling block to the sinner. But we need not be ashamed. Now, let me just give you a quick structure of Romans before we dive into those two verses. Romans chapter 1 begins in the first 15 verses with this wonderful introduction and a quick summary of the gospel message and Paul's display of his affection. And then in verse 15, Paul says, I am eager to come to preach the gospel to you. And that leads Paul to his main point. Why is he eager to preach? His main point is in verse 16 to 17. He says, for, meaning here is the reason I'm eager to preach. For, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of this gospel message. That's the main point of Romans. If you want to Wow somebody, and they say, hey, what's the main point of Romans? Just give it to them right there. It is in verse 16 and 17, the gospel, that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. And really, the rest of Romans is talking about unpacking this reality that he's not ashamed of Jesus. He's not ashamed of the gospel. If we are ashamed of the gospel, we will hide the greatest display of love and life. And so we don't have to be, all right? We want to stand with Paul, not ashamed. Amen? Let me give you really quick five reasons from these two verses why you don't need to be ashamed of the gospel. Number one, it's because the gospel reports what is good. The gospel reports what is good. Verse 16 goes on. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for, there's another for there, a foundational word, meaning let me tell you why I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, it's because, I mean, he even uses the word gospel, which means good news. It's a shameless proclamation of what is good. The word is euangelion in the Greek, u meaning good, angelion meaning messenger or news, good message, good news. Now certainly Paul probably had in mind Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7, which says how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This very Jewish understanding, this Old Testament understanding that there is a good news, a gospel message that is coming through the Messiah. But the word gospel in the original context also had a Greek uh, 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 cultural connotation. The Greeks used the word gospel. So for example, when Emperor Augustus was born a decade before Jesus, he was hailed as the Savior and the Son of God. And it, it is written of Emperor Augustus in their literature that his birth marks the beginning of the gospel. So Paul is also appropriating this old Jewish or this 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 uh, newer Greek word, Greek usage of the word gospel, and what he's saying is that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Son of God, and He is the one who's conquered, and He's the one whose kingdom is coming and is among us. It's good news. And so as Paul's beginning to talk about the gospel, he talks about it not as bad news, but as good news. I mean, just think about this. He's not apologetic about the gospel. You know, sometimes Christians say, well, you know, I don't like this part of truth. I don't, like, I don't really like this part of the Bible. I don't like this, this doctrine of, of God. And we kind of get all apologetic for who God is. We get apologetic sometimes even for aspects of the gospel message. But for Paul, every bit of it is actually good news. 
And so that's the first reason we don't need to be ashamed of it. It's because it's good news. Are you with me? Reason number two, why we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. It's because the gospel restores sinners to God. Verse 16 continues, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, somebody say power. It is the power of God unto salvation. That word power for the original reader would take people right back to the Exodus. In Exodus, 420 years after slavery, uh, slavery in Egypt, we find that the people of uh, the, the Hebrews are, are literally dying as they're building bricks with straws and their, their babies are being strategically killed. And here in Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, God says, For this reason I raised you up and brought you out of Exodus. Why? He says, to show my power. The power of God brought the Hebrews out of Egypt. And I don't have time to go through all of the miraculous displays of God's power that we see in the Exodus. But when we think of the power of God, we're talking about the same kind of power that split the Red Sea. The gospel, he says, is the power of God. Not contains the power of God, not is part of the power of God or is a display of the power of God, but he says the gospel is the power of God, meaning the same kind of power that brought the Hebrews out of Egypt is the same kind of power that God can use to save the hardest heart in your life. It's the same power that God used to rescue you from sin and from slavery to sin. For what? It's power for what? He says, unto salvation. Salvation. What does he mean by this word salvation? Well, if you're new to Christianity, let me, let me break this down for you really quick. Salvation has two connotations here. Number one, salvation means deliverance. Deliverance. So in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, we are saved or delivered from the wrath of God. Judgment for your sin is coming down on you without any hope. And so the gospel then has the power to save you, to deliver you from the judgment of God for your sin as that judgment is placed on Jesus instead of you. And secondly, salvation contains the idea of healing. We are also sin-sick rebels that need to be healed. And so the gospel comes with forgiveness and the power to bring us back into fellowship with God, to heal our relationship with God, so that we might be saved. Now, how is anybody saved? This is where we're saved. This is how we're saved. The power for salvation is in the proclamation of the gospel. Now, I want this to be encouraging for you to, to share the gospel with somebody. Because sometimes I think we feel like it's on us. Like we have to somehow convert somebody. We have to somehow say it the right way so that they get it. We have to come with the PhD kind of like answers and apologetics and have it all together in order to really win some over, somebody over to Jesus. But we're told here that the power unto salvation is not in me or in you, is it? It's actually in the gospel message. And so what we do then is we, we, we proclaim the gospel message, and even in our fumbling and our stumbling over our words, as we communicate correctly the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that message has the power of God unto salvation. For all who believe, which takes me to my third point, and that is that the gospel reaches for the whole world. The gospel reports what is good. The gospel restores sinners to God. And the gospel reaches for the whole world. For everyone, he says in verse 16. 
everyone who believes, wrap your mind around how crazy that would have been for the early Jewish Christian reader to hear that the gospel is for all the nations. It's for Jew and Gentile. It's for those on the inside and those on the outside. It's for the, those that have it together and those that don't have it together. Anybody who believes this message finds the power of the gospel unto salvation. It's not for those who simply obey the law. It's not for those who follow and do what is good. It is for rebels. Martin Luther, back in the day, he was, he was a monk, and, and he thought that he had to have it all together in order to be saved, and he, he uh, just could not do enough good deeds. And he looked at his life, and he says, what good deeds do I have? I've got nothing. And then he comes to these two verses, and what he discovers is that salvation is not by good deeds, but by grace. And so therefore, it's offered to all, and we just receive it. Let me give you an illustration of this. If I were to write a check to you for a million dollars, which I don't have the capacity to do, let's say a hundred dollars, that's a little more realistic. If I were to write a check to you, now we'll go with a million. If I were to write a check to you for a million dollars, and I, and I handed it to you, what do you what, what does it take for you to receive that million dollars? You got to cash it. Before you cash it, what do you got to do to the check? Take it and sign it. Endorse it. You say, this is mine. You receive it. Now, imagine you, you then take that check, you, you cash it, and you're living it up for a million dollars, and you're going around telling everybody, look at what I earned. Look at how good of a person I am. And then I, and I hear of that, I'd come to you, I'd be like, yo, that was a gift that you did not earn. You see, the gospel is a gift that you did not earn. But listen, the gospel is something that you receive, that you endorse, and you say, this is actually for me. Meaning this is not just good news for somebody out there. This is not just good news for these church people who sing songs. This is not just good news for your grandma who taught you about Jesus when you were little. But to become a Christian is to say, this good news is actually for me. It's mine. I'm taking this check and I'm signing my name on it. I'm, in, I'm endorsing. This is my good news. It's for everybody who believes. He goes on to say, to the Jew first and then also to the Greek meaning everybody is included in this gospel hope. It is not just for those who are likely to believe. It is not just for those who grew up in church. It's not just for good people. The gospel comes to everyone. Why? Because the gospel comes with power. You see the connection there? Because it has this kind of power, nobody is excluded from gospel hope. Is this gospel for your children who have walked away from Jesus? Yes. Is this gospel for your brother who you don't even speak with anymore? Yes. Is this gospel for your neighbor who gets on your nerves? Yes. Somebody said no. <laughs> no, it is. Who do you write off? Who do you believe is too far off? Who do, who do you believe is beyond the power of God unto salvation. So our takeaway is this. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Number four, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Fourth reason, we need not be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Verse 17, he continues. He says, for in it, the gospel message, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Now, commenta commentators say that the righteousness of God may have three different meanings here. One possible meaning is that the righteousness of God is referring to God's distributive righteousness. This is the negative aspect of God's judgment. This is God's distributive righteousness 
his judgment on the wicked. And God never judges wrongly. You know, human courts can make a wrong judgment. Just a few years ago, 84-year-old Isaiah Andrews was exonerated in Cleveland after uh, uh, serving the bulk of a life sentence for a crime that he did not do. You know, sometimes we don't trust the courts. We don't trust the judge because they can get it wrong. But God never judges wrongly. That's his distributive righteousness, meaning his righteousness is seen in his judgments. Secondly, another possibility here is for the righteousness of God is that it could mean God's definitive righteousness. This is God's action of establishing what is right. This is taking the Hebrews out of Egypt, definitively placing them in the, in the position that he wants them, his definitive righteousness. This is the kind of righteousness where we see God righting wrongs and healing the broken and forgiving the sinner and lifting the shame and placing us in Christ and making us his people. That's his definitive righteousness. Third possibility for righteousness of God here is is God's declarative righteousness. This is God's act of justification in which he declares one to be right. He declares one to be right. As an example, if I were to say to my kid, which I have one right here, this is Eden over here. Let's say I were to say to Eden, hey, if your room is clean, which her room is always clean, by the way, I'm not kidding. But if I were to say, hey, if if your room is clean, we can go out tonight and have have some dinner together. And I walk into her room, and it's a wreck. And I clean it for her. And then I go to her and I say, hey, I said, if your room is clean, we can go to dinner tonight. And look, your room is clean. We can go to dinner tonight. You can have the blessings because I have done the work on your behalf. This is God's declarative righteousness. If you are a moral person, if you perfectly follow the law, if you have perfect righteousness, you can then have all of the blessings of salvation and live forever in eternity with God being made new, raised from the dead, living in a new creation. Well, how can any of us receive that? If there is no stain of sin within God, how can we be made right with God? It's in his his declarative righteousness in which God looks at a sinner who has turned in repentance to Jesus Christ and believed in Jesus Christ, that Christ took the penalty for their sin on the cross, rising again on the third day from the dead. And they trust in Jesus, and God then places them into Christ and says, even though, in reality, you still sin. You have a long history of wickedness. I am declaring you righteous. I am declaring you perfect in Christ, in union with my son. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's how we can hear that. Not because we did well, but because Jesus did well. And God in his declarative righteous, righteousness placed us in Christ. So which one of it is, uh, these, these righteousnesses, is that a word? Which one of these plural righteousness is it? Well, I say it's all three. In the gospel, we see the whole of God's righteousness put on display. God distributes our judgment onto Christ. God rescues us from our sin. God restores us into the right relationship with himself, and God declares us to be righteous. There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. So what's our response? Our response is in verse 17, and it's faith. 
Let me read verse 17 again to you. He says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith. What's the key word there? Faith. Faith. Faith is the beginning and the end of our response. The righteous shall live by faith. And that was the line that hooked the young Martin Luther in which he realized the righteous do not live by good works. The righteous live by faith. By faith. Faith produces good works. Faith produces obedience to God. Faith produces love for God. But we live by faith. And that leads me to my last and final point. Number five. The gospel rewrites our future. The gospel rewrites our future. You see, we sometimes think destiny is something that we create. Kind of like playing chess and trying to work your chess board to where you win the game. My wife and I, we used to play chess together a lot when we were a young couple. And then we realized that our marriage was going to end if we keep playing chess together. It just turned into an argument every time. And usually she beat me. I'm being honest. She's not here with me today. And otherwise, you know, I would not tell you that if she was. Because she would then gloat over it. I'm telling you, all right? And uh, um, there's this old Italian proverb that that says on chess. It says, once the game is over, the king and the pawn go back into the same box. Meaning, you could try to work your chess, the chessboard of your life, so to speak, and try to position everything to where you get the money and get the job and get the power and get the relationships and get the friendships and the prestige or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, whether we end up a king or whether we end up a pawn, We all end up in the same box, eight feet deep. From dust to dust. It is appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. You see, what's our destiny? Without Christ, that's our destiny. Death is... Death is the end. But the gospel rewrites our destiny. Amen? Amen. The word-for-word translation of verse 17 here is simply this. The righteous by faith shall live. The righteous by faith shall live. Meaning the emphasis is not placed on the quality of our faith, but rather the emphasis is on the result of our faith. Oh, it's not great quality of your faith that produces life. Jesus says a mustard seed of faith is enough to save. Why? It's because of the object of our faith. We look to Christ The power is not in me. The power is in him. The righteous by faith then shall live. It's the result of our faith because of the object of our faith because the box couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't keep him. And while he met death, he got up from the dead. And in getting up from the dead, Jesus rewrote your destiny. He rewrote the end of your story. And so the gospel is good news, saints. It's good news, every bit of it. And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And that's why I'm so eager to preach to you. Because the gospel reports what is good and restores the sinner and reaches for the whole world and reveals the righteousness of God. The gospel rewrites your future. And so why be ashamed of the gospel? It's so good. Your gospel confidence comes 
from gospel comfort. Meaning as you fall back into the arms of faith, into the arms of Jesus through faith, and you are comforted in the gospel, you grow in your confidence in the gospel. So how do you become more confident? Become more comfortable with Jesus. Rest in Christ. When I gave this talk in abbreviated form to your youth, I ended with a story about peanut butter chocolate pie. And uh, so I'm going to end with the same story because peanut butter chocolate pie is really, really good. <laughs> when I was in college, I walked into the cafeteria and there was peanut butter chocolate pie. Never seen it before. I mean, this is like peanut butter, like kind of like a the filling, and then it was like, the crust was chocolate. And I, I took it to the t table, took one bite, and I was like, this is amazing. And I looked around the cafeteria, I was like, has anybody tried the peanut butter chocolate pie? So people started trying it and started eating it and enjoying it. And the next day I walked into the cafeteria and there wasn't any, any peanut butter chocolate pie. And I was like, hey, went to the lunch lady and I was like, where's, where's the pie? And so she went back to the freezer, pulled it out, you know, and had to thaw it a little bit, and we all began to enjoy the pie. And that became a thing. And so every time I walked in to the cafeteria, they would pull out the peanut butter chocolate pie. And everybody in the cafeteria was enjoying the peanut butter chocolate pie. And they all put on like 15 pounds, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, way too much peanut butter chocolate pie. My point is this. I became an evangelist for peanut butter chocolate pie because I tasted and saw that the pie was good. Are you with me? Has anybody tasted and seen that the Lord is good? What is it that gives us confidence in our gospel proclamation? It's because we've tasted and we have seen that the Lord is good. Oh, he is like honey on my lips. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is the only one that can satisfy us. Believe Jesus and proclaim to the world, what a Savior, what a Savior. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke in the dungeon, flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. And I rose and I went forth and I followed thee. Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Do not be ashamed of that message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel message which comes to us as your power for our salvation. God, I pray that everyone in this room would know the gospel, would believe the gospel, and would proclaim the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.